Good morning, and we are glad you're here this morning. This is a special chapel that we do each year, so if you notice that things are arranged slightly different from our weekly Wednesday experience, this morning we commemorate the beginning of the Lenten season. We call this chapel Reconciliation Chapel, which is the beginning of the 40-day period that some of you may be familiar with called Lent. In the Christian tradition, this is oftentimes called Ash Wednesday. So if you see some in our community with ashes on their forehead, it is in their tradition that they receive ashes today to remind them of their mortality and to also remind them that this is a season of penitence, of remembrance, of reflection. And we welcome you this morning for this special chapel. It has a different feel to it. It's more somber, reflective, penitent, because what we're gonna be starting today and then journeying through the 40 day period is a time in which we follow Jesus to remind us of what he had done for us as he journeyed to his ultimate sacrifice and death and then the victory of Easter, his resurrection. So this 40 day period takes us through the end of March, March 29th being Good Friday and then Easter Sunday on the 31st of March. I want to thank um, Dr. Ron Matthews uh, and Turning Point for their participation this morning and for Professors Janine Bryant and Selena Petaway and our entire dance department, Professor Welch, for helping us put together this collaborative effort each and every year. Some of you who have grown up in the Lenten tradition may remember that you're asked to give, to take away something from your daily routine, or maybe it's a, a favorite food, like chocolate or something like that, right? To deny yourself something during the Lenten season. And, you're, and I encourage you to do that. Maybe it's a media fast, maybe it's a Facebook fast one day a week or something. Something that will help us as a community, you know, shape and mold us. I'm gonna suggest that we could add certain things to our lives here at Eastern University. One of the things is you may know that we have every Thursday morning morning prayer at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and that would be a bit of a sacrifice for some of us, 7.30 in the morning. And so maybe adding that opportunity for prayer throughout the Lenten season would be wonderful. We also have devotionals, which you'll be instructed in a, in a few moments about how to, how to receive one from C.S. Lewis on Lenten devotional. And also 
the Apostles' Creed note cards that maybe you'll use this Lenten season to memorize the Apostles' Creed and to affirm the things that we believe as Christians. So I encourage you, this is an important church season in our lives here at Eastern University. We want to follow Jesus faithfully. We want to understand what he has done for us. And we do so as a community. And we'll have opportunities today, this morning, to participate in that journey. Would you please stand with me and let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter. Jesus' encounter with Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, 
after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary had stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but it was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they had thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, Lord, Already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you have sent me. 
When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus wept the falling tear, he mercy flowed beyond our bound. When Jesus groaned, a trembling fear sees all the guilty world. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the, sheep's, the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? When we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink. And when was it when you were a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it when you were sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, You that are accursed, 
Depart from me into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry and you gave me no food, I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will also answer, well, Lord, when was it when we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life.
A reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each one of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bend in, earth, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
As we begin this season of Lent, the motif of a journey is appropriate, that we journey together, we journey individually with Jesus. And to think about the Philippians 2 passage that was just read and sung, in many ways encapsulates what it means to follow Jesus, who became God in the flesh and dwelt among us, and now is Lord of all. I think the question, what is the gospel, is the most important question for those who study, work, play here at the university. Now, let me suggest that I'm not going to, in two or three minutes, give you every nuance about the gospel or all the, the content, but I can give you the essentials. Because I think sometimes we find that we have a tendency as Christian to add to the gospel, oftentimes because of our own self-righteousness. For instance, I had a conversation a number of years ago with a friend who was convinced that Christians do not bowl. Do not bowl? And at first I, because I go bowling. I'm not very good, I do use the bumpers still, but that's not the, the point. And I kept asking my friend, why do you think Christians don't go to bowling alleys? I mean, why do you think that's kind of part of the gospel? He says, well, I was told that because oftentimes there's alcohol, there's a bar in the bowling alleys that if you're there within so many feet or whatever, uh, you're contaminated, I guess, or something. And I thought, oh, that's really sad that that person's understanding of the gospel was relegated to whether you could go bowling or not. You see how sometimes we add things and we can go on and on. I want to, at least for this community, to always be certain about the essentials of the gospel, about why we talk about Jesus and why we follow Jesus and why we pray and practice disciplines in this community. Let me tell you that when we, when we think about the gospel, I'm going to actually go to the Apostle Paul for a moment, read a scripture and highlight a couple things and then we'll move on because I don't want you to miss the importance of always asking the question, whether you've been here one year, 10 years, 20 years working here, what is the gospel? The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 the following. This is an early letter of Paul. He's a missionary. The gospel is emerging out into the Greco-Roman world. He writes to this community, this city called Corinth. And this is what he says. This is Paul now in 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you now stand, though which you are now being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as, one untimely, as to one untimely timely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That's the gospel. Now I know that means, what do you mean by that? But in, in essence, we have the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go to the next slide. Simply, simply, although profoundly, Christ died for our sins. Paul is saying he wants to continue to hand on something that he received. Christ died for our sins. When we look at the cross, it is not just an emblem of our faith, it is essential to what Christ did for us, both as individuals and for the world. He did so accordance to the scriptures, and that he was buried and raised on the third day. God raised Jesus from the dead. And that has implications for how you study, 
how you live in this world, how I live in this world. It is not just about Jesus' death, although incredibly important for our sins and for the sins of the world, but Paul wants to remind us that he rose, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and because of that, we can live in this body, we can live in this world confidently. It's not just about the afterlife, the eternal life, although that is granted to all those who believe. It's about living abundantly now, living faithfully now, following Jesus now. And what I make one final observation, what I love about this text is that Paul is very adamant that Jesus hung around after his resurrection. He wants to say, look at all the people he visited. And to me, of course, that means that God's presence is still with us. It wasn't as if Jesus rose from the dead and then sent a text message or did something, just kind of let us know, like a banner in the sky or something, but that Jesus lingered days and days and days after to let us know his presence is with us. So what is the gospel? Christ died for our sins. And because of that, we know what it means to come to the cross with humility and faithfulness. And also Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, we can live and live with confidence and faith that God's presence is always with us now and forever. Amen.
Labyrinth walking is an ancient practice used by many different faiths for spiritual centering, contemplation, and prayer. Entering the path of a labyrinth, the walker walks slowly while quieting their mind and focusing on a spiritual question or prayer. Labyrinths have no blind alleys or dead ends. Once at the center, pilgrims progress forward to exit. In this way, it symbolizes a journey to a predetermined destination, such as a pilgrimage to a holy site, or a journey through life from birth to spiritual awakening and death. The shape we will walk together this morning is that of a cross. Even though the path is straight, please feel free to pause or walk slowly as you make your way through. Please take a card prior to entering the cross. They are placed on the floor along the way. You may read silently or recite out loud the Apostles' Creed. You can also stand along the edges of the cross and pray for those who are walking through as well as enter and exit through the spaces. Come now and walk through the cross to the cross and may your journey be blessed.
Jesus Christ, suffering, dying, and rising again from the dead. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my iniquity. He heals all my diseases. He redeems our lives from destruction and crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. He fills our years with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our King, our abundant life, our healer, our forgiver, the lover of our soul. Lord Jesus, we love you. And as we leave, may we leave walking in you, with you, by you, and for you. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.